Jeff, if we want to try to figure out what it's all about, we can take everything back to the fundamental laws of physics. How do we look at those fundamental laws? Which are the most fundamental? How deep can you go? Well, first of all, I, I don't know, in principle, if we'll ever really know. If we'll ever know everything that can be known in principle about the laws. Um, there's a lot that's unknown there. It's an open question. But, OK, we can deal with what we know so far and, uh, and, and the question that you asked. So one thing, in, one is what's natural to ask about this is, that, you know, of course, where do the where do the laws come from? You know, why is it that the constants of nature are just the way they are, so that we have uh, the kind of physics we have, which supports life, uh, chemistry, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera? Um, uh, you know, some decades ago, it was not fashionable to ask that question, mm -hmm. um, and since then, uh, it's another example of one of the big questions that's become uh, central in physics to try to answer. The sorts of uh, discoveries that uh, Aharonov has made and that I spent a lot of my time working on give a very different uh, approach and perspective on that question than what uh, other people are doing. Um, and so one of, uh, I have to, have to explain two different uh, aspects, uh, two different fundamental discoveries which um, uh, tell us something about the, the origin of the laws. One is the idea that the future is relevant to the present. Uh, very uh, uh, important idea that's led to all kinds of interesting physics. And the other is um, a new kind of non-locality uh, uh, called dynamical non-locality, which... Define non-locality. Well, non-locality... Um, uh, fundamental to quantum uh, physics. Fundamental to quantum mechanics. Um, people have said that this is really the most profound discovery of science. So the, really the first kind of non-locality uh, was based on uh, uh, one of the complaints that Einstein had about quantum mechanics. You know, he was always, even though he was one of the fathers of the theory, as sometimes happens, uh, parents are not mm -hmm. happy with their children, and he never got over this. Uh, the basic indeterminism of the theory. So he's famous for saying, God does not play dice. There must be something there in nature which explains why, you know, if you have two identical atoms, this atom decays and emits a photon after one hour, whereas this atom decays after one minute. There must be something in nature that tells it. Or a billion years. Or a billion years or something. There must be something there. He struggled and struggled with it and never found it. And for that matter, all the experiments seem to indicate that really dice is being played. Um, Eventually, he gave up trying to show that the theory was wrong. That's where he spent some decades, and it was kind of a little bit of an embarrassing point. Um, at one of these, these famous Solvay meetings, he would always come up with some new <laughs> paradox. He said, ah, this is it, you know. He came up with the idea of a, a photon in a box, that he could violate the energy-time uncertainty relation. Um, namely, uh, you could have more precision on the energy and know uh, the time of an event better than what the Heisenberg uncertainty relation uh, allowed for. And everybody was uh, terribly, you know, uh, they were shocked. They said, Einstein's finally done it. He's shown that the theory is wrong, you know, which would be extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And Bohr, Niels Bohr was, you know, in a terrible state. You know, was, you know, going back and forth saying, if Einstein is right, it would be the end of physics, mm -hmm. is what he would say. And he struggled and struggled throughout the night. And finally, in the morning came his, his, uh, his, uh, his brilliant uh, discovery. And what he showed is that, unfortunately, Einstein actually forgot about his own theory of general relativity. And he forgot to uh, recognize the fact that the gravitational potential uh, of, uh, uh, changes the, 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 the uncertainty in the time, has an influence uh -huh. on what the time is. So at that point, Einstein gave up trying to show that the theory was wrong. And he tried to show that the theory was just incomplete. There was something that was missing. And so he came up with this example that's known as the einstein podolsky rosen state, which he posed as a thought was something just an example to show that the theory must be incomplete. People thought that was interesting. Nothing happened with it for 20 some years until eventually, actually it was Yakir Aharonov and David Bohm who showed that for the first time that in fact this uh, state, the EPR state uh, was really there. 
that it was really uh, empirically you could prove that it was part of the structure of nature. And if some eight years later, John Bell showed that a uh, very beautiful argument to show that it looks like there's a kind of non-locality which is going on there. And what it meant was that um, uh, this kind of non-locality is called kinematic non-locality. But it means that if you look at particles which are in a state called entangled, which is what Einstein basically set up, um, even if you, you can't write, uh, put, you can't put a sticky note on this particle and say, here's all of its properties, and put a sticky note on this particle here and say, here's a list of all of its properties. You can't say those properties exist in a local way, which is the way our classical world looks. In fact, they're entangled, meaning those properties that only exist between the two of them. They don't exist locally. So that was called kinematic non-locality. And then along came, you know, two years after Bohm and Aharonov made that argument that there's this kinematic non-locality, they discovered the Aharonov-Bohm effect, which is uh, one of the fundamental aspects of modern physics. And this led to a completely different kind of non-locality called non the dynamical non-locality. And this uh, showed that the equations of motion of quantum mechanics are explicitly non-local, that uh, you know, things can interact at different points uh, in space and in time in a, in a, in a way that uh, no classical system would work. You see, in classical physics, if you have a force on a particle here, it must be the case that if you look at the potential, then there's a gradient to the potential. Mm -hmm. For example, we're experiencing gravity here, and there's a gradient to our potential of the gravitational field. And that's, that explains what the, what the force is. But with dynamical non-locality, you can have forces, even though there's no gradient to the field. There may be a gradient over here. There may be a change over there. Nevertheless, that's just the structure of, of, of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> so getting back to your original question, you know, where do the laws of physics come from? <clears throat> In order to even answer this question, one needs to answer the question of what are the basic axioms that go into the theory? What are the basic principles that lead us to quantum mechanics? We don't even know the answer to that question. In special relativity, we knew them very well. We knew that there were you know, two basic axioms, which led to all these much more complicated effects in, in relativity. So we had an intuition about them. We understood these complicated effects. They were easy to derive. But quantum mechanics, we don't know what the axioms are. We don't know its deep principles. Um, and so therefore, every time we make some new discovery, it looks very bizarre. Um, so we, we've been considering some basic principles which help us to answer the question of where the laws of physics come, physics come from. And the kind of principles that go into this are the notion of causality, the notion of non-locality, the notion that the future can be relevant to the present. And it turns out from these basic principles, you can derive as a consequence of having these things live together the fact that you have to have uncertainty. You have to have a kind of playing of dice. And that's just really the beginning of the story, because it turns out with these new ways of thinking about it, one can get incredibly rich uh, new ways, fundamentally new ways of thinking about the laws of nature. What do you mean by a law? Um, uh, what do you mean by the question, how does the system change in time? But the fundamental point you're saying is that at the basic level, the most basic level, you're dealing with these three factors, causation, uh, the future can affect the, the present, and non-locality. That's right. Given those three things, the laws of physics have to sort of adapt themselves, if you will, uh, to, to make those three, which seemingly they're incoherent together. They can't live together. They, they can't live together. Exclusive. The laws of quantum physics, because of the structure of it, the probabilistic nature of it, the uncertainty of it, the indeterminism, will enable those things, three things to live together. One can derive the fact that we have uncertainty, the fact that we have playing of dice. You have to have that as a consequence of these deeper principles, not the other way around. The usual way of thinking about quantum mechanics is that really the uncertainty, the playing of dice, was the fundamental, fundamental thing. Right, right, right. And then we just have, as, as Abner Shimoni always used to say, we have a peaceful coexistence between the non-locality and causality. Mm -hmm. They just, it, it works out. See, yeah. the, the way of ordering the principles is the other way around. The, the, way, the usual way to think about quantum mechanics, the uncertainty is the deep thing. Yeah, it's yeah, the fundamental yeah, yeah. axiom. And then these other things follow from it. Now we're just switching it around. We're saying the deep thing is the non-locality. The deep thing is the causality. The deep thing is the future is relevant to the present. And if you want to have these things living together, you can derive as a consequence of them the fact that you have the playing of dice. So 
from this, we get something incredibly beautiful and positive from this playing of dice, not just the old way of thinking about it, that nature is capricious, just stuff happens for no reason whatsoever. But in fact, there's a deep reason for uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of uncertainty.